I'm sure you know that feeling as a customer where you're thinking, well, everything would be so much better if this organization had a little bit more empathy for me. But is that really the case? In this episode, we're going to explore how much empathy does an organization actually need for its customers and how do you build that empathy, especially in an environment where it's not part of the daily conversation, like the government. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, my name is Michael Clip, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 94. Hi, I'm Mark, and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to design organizations that put people at the heart of their business. The guest in this episode is somebody who was born in Suriname, but now works and lives in the Netherlands. She's competing in the national championships as a slope rower, and she has an amazing research project on what it means to be a compassionate civil servant. Her name is Maike Klip. I'm really excited to share this chat with Maike with you because I think she has found an ingenious way to get people working in the government to talk about a difficult topic like empathy. So at the end of this episode, you'll have learned about a design research method, which is not common day, but you might also want to use in your organization to start a conversation about empathy. If you haven't done so already, make sure to click that subscribe button and that bell icon to get notified when new videos are out because we share at least one video per week that will help to level up your service design skills. That's all for the intro and now let's quickly jump into the chat with Micah. Welcome to the show, Micah. Thank you very much, Mark. Happy to have a fellow Dutch woman uh, on the show. It, we haven't had many people from the Netherlands, so happy happy to see you here. Thank you very much. Um, for the people who don't know who you are, uh, you're doing cool stuff, but I can imagine no, not everybody has Googled you yet. Could you give like a brief introduction in what you're doing these days? Yes, yes, that's, uh, that's good. So I work for the Dutch government as a digital strategist, the executive agency for education. Um, and uh, we have a very, well, I think it's a big design team in-house for about 25 people. And um, well, it's not um, besides my, well, it's, it's, it's half my job at um, Duo and half not. I also have this photo series of um, civil servants where I ask my colleagues if I can uh, photograph them as a compassionate civil servant. So this series actually gives me a lot of insight about what is uh, what government needs uh, to make good services. So it's like this part-time uh, personal project and also part-time uh, job uh, that I can really incorporate uh, to do my job better. So hmm. I think that's, uh, in short, uh, what I do. Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh... We'll be talking about good services and compassionate civil servants uh, a lot in good services. <laughs> it's quite a popular so, yeah. to topic at this moment. There, I think there is a book out yes. these days. Yeah, from me uh, down, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the question I ask everybody um, is, what is your first memory of service design? Um. <clears throat> Well, I think that um, I started in working in UX, um, I think six years ago, and um, I really didn't have a background in UX at all. But when I worked for a year um, at the same uh, organization I work now, um, I remembered going to the service design and government conference in London. And it was like a small conference. There were mostly people from uh, London or from the UK. And I was there with some of my colleagues from uh, the Netherlands. And I remembered Lou Down talking there about service design. And uh, I thought uh, they were really cool. Um, and they had such an interesting uh, approach. So I think that was when I started to um, read more about service design and see my work. I started as a user researcher. not And I, and that, I think that's when I started seeing my work, not just as doing research, but also looking broader and uh, thinking about how can I have more impact with my research in the organization and maybe change 
things more than just coming up with insights. Mm. Yeah. I think a lot of uh, researchers with or uh, not within service design are sort of interested <clears throat> in actually turning insights into action, right? Making making yeah. sure that insights yeah. uh, get acted upon. So really curious yeah. to what you have, have to say about that. <coughs> Are you okay. ready to do some interview jazz? Yes. Let's do it. Yes, I am. Um, I have the <coughs> topics over here. You have the uh, uh, now world famous service design show question starter. So let's start with topic number one, which is called understanding. understanding. Do you have a question yeah, starter? So... And can you show it to us? Yes, I will. Because you gave me six question starters and I think they all fit here, but I will... Um... Just pick, uh, yeah, it's jazz. I would pick this so one. Yeah, how much? How much understanding do you need? Because, um, shall I introduce the question? Please do. Let's, yeah, yeah. how much understanding okay. do we need? How much understanding do you need? Because that is, um, you know, when I started um, my work in service design in digital government, I, I was... I was pretty black and white in the way I thought about uh, understanding about about empathy for users. I thought that everybody should have more empathy and everybody didn't have enough of it. So I was pretty condescending, I think. Um, and I think that is also what um, what sparked my photo series about the compassionate civil servant, because I wanted to portray everyone um, as well with understanding for citizens and as, with compassion. And I was investigating on how much um, empathy and how much uh, understanding do you actually need? Because in the last couple of years, I also did a lot of research on what em empathy actually is. Hmm. And I noticed that um, it is, um, well, when you, when you do a lot of research into one subject, it can be, become quite philosoph uh, philosophical, but also um, you get much, much more nuanced about it. So I learned in my research project that um, empathy actually is a skill. And depending on where you are in the process of service design of, or in your organization, you, you can have, you, can, you do need more or less understanding, but it's not like this black and white thing. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's mm -hmm. something that I'm very interested in. And also if, if that's your approach, if you think that is as a skill and that you can be a bit more nuanced about it, then it's really interesting to, look okay so what's the next step if you're having this position within the process so how much understanding do you need and how are you going to get it so that's why i like how much as a question yeah starter. yeah i can imagine we often talk about mm. empathy like uh people don't have it or you do have mm. empathy like really it's mm. sort of uh, an on and off <laughs> switch um, yeah so if it is a skill and we can we have sort of uh gradualities and nuances in there how do we answer the question how much and and i guess it's yeah. how much understanding for the other person right or towards the other person yeah. whether yeah, it's your colleague or a citizen or yeah. because what, what i do in my work for the government is i approach this um these di digital services more or less as a relationship you know it's not about um well you know at the organization where I work, we do a lot of um, uh, educational-wise services. So, for example, students can apply for student loans. We do a lot of school fundings. Um, but but it, when you look at surface design, it's I think the, 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 the short term is people just want to, to get their shit done. You know, just I'm, I'm applying for student finance. I, I want the money on my bank account. But in the long term, people also want to know if they can trust the government, if you get me, if you understand who I am and what, what I need. And a lot of people have this re lifelong relationship with government. You know, if you apply for student loans, that's the start of like a 20 year relationship uh, with us. So um, um, and what I also noticed about empathy, because uh, if you approach it as a relationship, um, it's it's. Uh, per definition about humans and not about applications and technical stuff. But if you look at empathy, and I think that's for me was um, sometimes hard to understand um, that government as a whole, you don't want government to work on empathy. 
because empathy also has a lot of flaws. You know, it's very random. Mm. I have empathy for you because I got to know you a little bit preparing this podcast. But um, one of your colleagues, I don't know him at all. So I might not have empathy for him at all, you know. So especially government, you don't want government to work on empathy. You want government to be just, to be equal, to be right, you know. So for a lot of people working in government, you know, on the one side, you have this law and this law is just and equal. And on the other hand, you want it to be human. But it's it's so empathy is, is, a, is, a, is a difficult subject, you know, because empathy is so personal. So um, when I'm asking colleagues how much empathy do you need, uh, how understanding are you as a civil servant? It's a really hard question for a lot of them. And it's hard because they might want to be more <laughs> understanding, but it, th that clashes they, they with... Might feel, yeah. yeah, they might feel that, that it's not appropriate in their jobs because, um, uh, you know, you have this law dictating uh, how it should be. Um, but also because it's... I think um, that in government we don't have maybe... Well, this is maybe just my opinion, um, but I think we haven't talked about it uh, enough yet because we, um, I think empathy is not um, a goal in itself. It's just like a tool for your toolbox and you can, um, it's like this, um, you know, when it's dark, you put up a light and you can just see this part of the room and that's how you should use empathy to make a way. So what I um, discovered is government shouldn't work on empathy, but when we make government, you know, in service design, we make these services, you can, of course, use understanding as a tool, but it's like this really nuanced uh, part. And I think that a lot of people are still struggling how to use that tool if mm. the end result shouldn't be run on right. empathy at all. Right, right. So uh, <laughs> you make a distinction between empathy in the design process versus empathy yes. in the service that is being delivered. Yes, hmm. yes, yes. But also not because in the de when you talk about the design process, but maybe that's just in my organization, it gets really claimed by designers. And what I'm trying to do at my organization is to, um, you know, if you if you look at the process from a law being made made up. And the execution, you know, you're calling us or you're going to the website. Sure. Yep. You have this whole process. And I think that um, everybody that takes part in that process, you know, the business analyst, mm -hmm. the, the product owner, uh, the people answering the phone, everybody um, is part of that service and everybody needs, uh, well, how much understanding does everybody need in that process? But I noticed that when I but maybe that's a question. Um, and I'm also wondering how you think about it. When I talk about the design process, a lot of people think it's just about this little part of that whole process because design is such a, mm -hmm. a term that people claim or, or don't claim, you know, and still, I'm, I'm yeah. still figuring it out how to uh, make it more inclusive for everyone working in my organization to tell them you're all part of this and we all need empathy as a tool, but we're all struggling in how to use it. And that's, mm. that's okay because we're making progress. So... Yeah. We'll, we'll uh, dive mm -hmm. into that uh, subject uh, at a later moment, I guess, because now uh, we need to close off maybe or transition okay. into transition yeah. into topic number two, um, which is called responsibility. <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I think I'm going to put this one. How can we... Mm -hmm. have how can we have responsibility? And I think that um, responsibility and understanding is actually not very much, well, it's different, of course, but I think it's like this understanding is one and responsibility is step two, you know? Because if you, what I noticed that when I talk with my colleagues about how, what an understanding civil servant they are um, and how they deal with empathy and, and if they even feel empathy at all for uh, citizens and, and our users. Um, we get to talk about their work, about why they go to work, what it, what's in it for them, but also what their responsibilities are. And what I notice is that a lot of people in government are don't have the overview of the whole process, mm -hmm. you know, um, 
at the organization where I work, um, we're quite big, I think. Well, not as big as others, but maybe 3,000 people work there. And we do a lot of our services in-house. I think most of them. So that, that is, of course, has benefits because you can do everything on your own as an organization. But also it's so big that a lot of people don't know what their neighbor is doing, you know, and they don't know their part in the process because it's such a big process. And if you don't know what the impact is of the part you're doing, you don't know if it even matters if you have empathy, but you also cannot take responsibility for the end result. So I think that that empathy and responsibility, understanding and responsibility is like maybe the same puzzle, you know. Um, yeah, so that's yeah, something I'm yeah. wondering. Yeah. So <clears throat> what kind of responsibility are we talking about? Is it like <clears throat> responsibility for uh, satisfying citizens or? Yeah, maybe that's a scale as well. No, but. <laughs> Well, I'm thinking, um, I'm thinking it's smart, small, the responsibility to have ownership of your work, you know, and to make, to make uh, your work better if you want to, and not waiting for like a manager or a colleague, you know. Um, I think it starts with that, the ownership of your own work. There's a responsibility of your own work, but I think it gets bigger because um, a lot of people don't feel responsible or they can't take responsibility for the relationship that government has with citizens mm -hmm, because, mm -hmm. you know, what is my impact? I'm sure. not the one having the relationship. But together, we all form this organization and that organization has a relationship. So I think that if you, but I think it starts small. It starts you going to work today, feeling that you can have ownership of what you do. And um, yeah, I think, and then it can translate to something bigger. Yeah. <laughs> I would be curious <laughs> if you found examples of um, people who do feel responsible for the end result, because I can imagine that there are quite many people who do feel responsible for their work, but making the mm -hmm. leap, the next leap, like, <clears throat> how do you do that? Is that even possible? Yeah, yeah because then you're talking about well, I think it starts with awareness. So I'm remembering this interview I did with one of my colleagues, uh, Jean, it's called. And um, he's a business analyst and he wanted his portrait to be, um, well, I asked the question. He was like sitting sitting there thinking and I photographed him like a bit like, you know, that face, like like thinking hard and, and don't know. And he said, yeah, that's my portrait as a compassionate civil servant. I was like, that's more like an anti Mm -hmm. portrait mm -hmm. and he said yeah because i think empathy is a hard word for me and I'm, I'm struggling and then he said something else in his interview because when you look at this process and he's a bit more um in the start of this whole execution of uh laws and but the way he does his work he comes up with um uh analyzes and of, he analyzes how things should be for example in the uh uh, help desk so he says when people in the help desk doesn't they, when they don't have like um the opportunity to show empathy that's my responsibility to think of here so in the interview that i had with him it started uh, with how much empathy do you have and how can you uh, incorporate uh, understanding in your work and then it's translated into i am responsible for so much more but i don't know how to do that so then it's interesting because when that happens with someone, then you can start talking about change and you can start asking, okay, do you want something to change and how can we do that? But if uh, people, and I think also teams don't have that awareness themselves, you cannot take the next step. Right. So you know, it, it's <clears throat> obvious, but it starts with awareness that you, that you're part of a bigger system. Of course, <clears throat> you sort yeah. of know that because you go to work to a big organization, but um, when the conversation is not focused on that, when the conversation is focused yeah. on your specific role, then I can imagine it's it's hard to yeah understand. Yeah, but also you know it's it's like everybody has such a complicated job. So mm. um, how many times a, a week do you take the time to really understand what someone else is doing? You know, and and making these portraits gave me the chance. I have like these two-hour interviews with colleagues. 
uh, while phot uh, photographing. And for a lot of people, they, they also tell me, oh, this, this has been a long time since I told someone so thoroughly about what I do uh, right. at work. So that was interesting for me as well. Yeah, you know, yeah. So it's like having a meaningful uh, conversation. Um, I'm not saying we don't have meaningful conversations at work, but a I different don't think kind that a lot of people... Yeah, yeah, a different kind. And maybe not so... Um, uh, so more, uh, you know, so deep into why you do your work and uh, what you want to achieve with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in in that way, like mm -hmm. uh, doing interviews and making photos of people is maybe an excuse in between quotes to have these conversations, right? It's it's not yeah. about the photo; it's yeah. about the conversation that happens. Yes. Yes, of course. Yeah. Well, um, talking about conversations, let's. Yeah. Translate or no trans trans transform into topic number three, which isn't uh, <laughs> coincidentally linked to conversations because this one is about yeah. open conversations. Yes, I already knew that, of course. So that was <laughs> like this this really great uh, cliffhanger. Yeah, and I'm I'm going to choose the what if conversation starter. Mm -hmm. What if we have an open conversation? Um, what is an open conversation not, in your perspective? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, um, when you asked me to prepare for the podcast and you asked me for some topics, I wrote like this open conversation as a, as a conversation piece because um, I write about my work uh, on my research blog, and that's well, what is I the think, URL? I'll link to it down below. Yeah, it's it's well, it's Dutch. It's clip klaar. Okay, um, <laughs> I'll link to it. Yeah. It's, yeah, and it's my name, Clip, and it's like this fun wordplay in Dutch. It's like Clip done, but yeah. So, Clip but it, Clark, it, it translates. Yeah. Very, yeah, it translates very bad in English, but that's okay. So, um, it's also a Dutch research blog, but Google Translate will be your friend. Um, so yeah, I, I write about my work, and I also write these stories that colleagues tell me on my research blogs, and that's open for everyone to read. And I noticed some of I noticed some things. Um, since I've been writing. I have this blog for, I think, three or four years now. And first of all, it has so many benefits to have an open conversation. And I think open conversation is open. Everybody can read it, you know, and it's not hard to find and it's equal for everyone. Um, and also open conversation means that people can react, you know, it's also, I'm there with my name, you can send me an email. Um, so, and I would love, and I always love to hear, uh, comments and, uh, discussions with others. And I think that, that, um, first of all, I learned so much because I got to meet all kinds of people working in government and all these different perspectives helped our team to grow. But also I learned that for people to share their personal story about working in government has created this open conversation about what is hard for us, but it also created more overview on this whole um process you know because suddenly other people started um how do you say that so um one colleague says oh but it's also in the interview with sean that, that mm. he mentioned it mm -hmm. so they start you know uh directing to each other and you really can see this process uh, going on and because it's in the open you can follow it and people start recognizing it so i noticed that has like this really big benefit but I also noticed something else that it's that it's really scary by times because it's so vulnerable to show yourself, sure. you know, yeah. for, yeah, for my colleagues in the pictures, it, they are really vulnerable pictures, but also to have this open conversation for government as a whole, you know, my organization thinks, OK, so she's writing all this stuff. OK, OK, what's it going to do? You know, government is really closed. Um, so I think that's really interesting. And that's why I also chose the what if question starter, because I thought, you know, I'm just I'm just doing one thing, trying. But what if we have more open conversations, you know, and what would change and what would would we uh, would it be easier to have a better relationship with citizens? Would it be easier to be more responsible? Hmm. Yeah. What if we do that more? So, um hmm. I want to go back to when you started the blog three or four years ago. Okay. Did you ask permission? Did you just do it? Uh, what was that process like? Um, <laughs> yeah. So 
I started the research blog because I wanted to learn more about UX and service design. And I found it hard to find uh, Dutch websites um, from others like me learning and also in, in government, but as a whole. So I just started out, you know, and if you go in the archive, I find the first blogs, they are like, oh, I read a book. It's a nice book. You know, it's like these really simple blogs. And I think it kind of evolved into um, the blog I have now, which is really more on point and, and, and I'm delving much deeper into mm -hmm. different kind of subjects. So when I started the blog, of course, I mentioned it to my boss and my manager and they thought, yeah, sure. If you want to write about a book you write, be my guest. Little did they know <laughs> that it would evolve into so much more. Right. No, but yeah. Um, but that's also a thing, you know, I, I do everything in the open. So every step of the way, um, everybody can see. And and I, I what I do now, because it's, it's a bit more, uh, of course, I have more sensitive issues on the blog now. So before I post something, I might uh, ask a colleague, please read with me. I go to the communication department at my organization. Okay, I'm going to post this blog. So, you know, beforehand. So that's, you know, just sure. good working together. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And <laughs> <coughs> have you, um, you said at least colleagues read some of uh, the interviews, but have you also mm -hmm. gotten some interaction with actual people outside of the organization, citizens or different um, departments within the government? And if so, what were these responses? Yeah. I think that um, I think most of the people reading my blog are working in design or government. And maybe my dad, you know, but that's going to be it because it's like such a niche uh, sure, subject. Yeah. And so um, I don't think students are reading the blog. But what I do know is whenever I'm at school talking with students and doing research, I, you know, I have this little... Um, little thing I do that I bring cards and on the back it says, this is how I'm a compassionate civil servant. And I'm asking students to write what they think sh we as civil servants should know about them so we can be compassionate. And then, um, and I think that's a really fun exercise because you see these students thinking, oh, oh, they're thinking about having more compassion for me. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. And then you see this connection happen that they also don't see just the organization, but I see, hey, there are people behind that organization. So, um, and then, you know, a lot of students say, oh, it's so great that you talk about this at your organization. Uh, they should have more empathy for me, you know? And uh, so I think that's that's great. And that's that, that are ways that I'm trying to make that connection. But what I do like about this blog is, of course, a lot of my own colleagues are reading it, but also a lot of people in other governmental organizations right. are reading it. Yeah. So what I'm trying to do with my writing is to you know working at the executive agency for education is just one type of government you know and it's it's like my case but what i hope is that the insights are um are available for others sure. and that it's also working for others so yeah what's what's really interesting <laughs> is that we started out with the word understanding and it started out like inside out understanding from within the organization who is providing the service towards the people who are uh, getting the service. But I, from yeah. what you've said um, <clears throat> just now, it's also the other way around, like sh opening up the organization towards the, the audience also creates an understanding what is going on inside the organization and maybe yeah. creating more understanding how things are happening, that it's actually people thinking about stuff, uh, being yeah. careful. Uh, so it's it's creating understanding both ways. I think ways. both ways. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's how a relationship works, right? Um, I, I did this exercise with like a yellow rope uh, where I went on uh, the streets in Rotterdam and I, 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 I uh, tied the, the rope around my waist and I asked people, how do you want to connect with me, the government? So that was like a fun exercise that I didn't thought away uh, all the way through but uh, you know I had some great conversations and I noticed a lot about people wanting to be connected also a lot of people who didn't want to be connected at all and I noticed that when you open up government and you really start showing yourself and talking about what also what are the challenges you know right. um, 
people really want to help you solve them. So sure. yeah. students want to come to the office and think mm. with us how we can do better. So I think that's that's maybe the start of doing great service design, inviting others and showing yourself. Um, yeah. yeah, but it's so scary to open up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I know you didn't prepare for this question, but uh, as we're okay. doing the interview jazz, you'll be able to, to handle it for <laughs> sure. So is there a question that you'd like to ask us, the viewers and listeners of the show? Hmm. Um, oh, wow, that's a good question. Because I think the the listeners of the show are mostly service designers like myself. So, yeah, maybe maybe the the last the last question: What if open conversation? I'm, I'm because that's that's also a question I'm not sure of myself, right? I'm just trying something, and I'm just wondering how other people deal with that and how other people try to incorporate more of the uh, other person, you know, the users into their organization. It's maybe a bit of a cliche question because everybody asks that. But I'm really curious uh, to know um, how other people are doing that. Because, you know, I think that's a question that we, we say all the time. We need people to be more involved. But how mm -hmm. are people really going about into changing that and doing that? That's something I would like to know. Yeah. Mm. So what are, what are your tips, tricks, techniques, methods to <laughs> actually really involve people in the design process? <clears throat> Just ask them, I think. Yeah, well, that's yeah. That wasn't a, specifically <laughs> a question for you, but this is the question yeah. towards the community. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I can imagine that, like making photos or doing interviews is is one way to actually do it. And yeah. I I would love to hear more, like these sort of secret hacks, uh, how people are involving yeah. other people. Yeah. If yeah, people want to get in touch great. with you, Michael, what is uh, the best way? Um, yeah, there are so many ways. Uh, what of is course, the you best? can send me an uh, <laughs> email. I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, all kinds of stuff. And of course, you can read my blog. If um, if people want the English version of the photo series, uh, that's also available. Um, that's on the begripvolle ambtenaar.nl. But there's also an English uh, part of the website. So I'll make sure all the links are in the in the show notes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that would be great. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing this story. I like the, uh, I, I, I need to find a better word, but the war stories, people who are actually <laughs> getting their hands dirty and doing yeah. and doing the stuff and running into challenges. So um, yeah, it was great to hear your, uh, your story, Maaike. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So what is your take on Maaike's question? How do you involve people in the design process? Uh, leave your tips, tricks, and techniques down below in the comments. We would love to know. If you enjoyed this episode, consider sharing it with just one other person today who might find it helpful as well. That way you'll help to grow the Service Design Show community and that helps me to invite more cool guests like Mikey here on the show. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next episode, which you can find over here.